Hare Krishna, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Krishna and Vrindavan. Today we're going to be talking about the chastisement of Kaliya by Krishna. So, Krishna, 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 hey, Krishna, 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 hey, Krishna, 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 Rakshama. Krishna, 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 Hanima. Rama, Raghava, Rama, Raghava, Rama, Raghava, Rakshama. Krishna, Keshava, Krishna, Keshava, Krishna, Keshava, Pahima. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So we're starting here from Canto 10, the end of chapter 15. Uh, so after Krishna, uh, so another day, this is a day after Krishna killed Dainikasura, some days later. Uh, one day they were out in the forest, Krishna, the cowherd boys, and all the cows. And uh, it was a hot day, the sun was blazing, the boys were tired and thirsty, and they went to the Yamuna to drink some water because generally the Yamuna was very clean and uh, they could just sip water from the Yamuna whenever they were thirsty. Uh, but this day uh, they went there and they drank the water and the water was had been poisoned. So as soon as they touched it, they didn't even drink it. They just got near it and uh, they all just passed out. They all fell on the ground unconscious. And so when Krishna saw them like that, then uh, he was, you know, obviously thinking, oh no, what happened to my beloved friends? He was very compassionate. But he just uh, glanced over them and they came back to life uh, and uh, everything was okay. But then uh, Krishna was thinking that, you know, this can't happen again. We have to, you know, get to the root of this problem. And the root of the problem was Kaliya. So Kaliya was this big, a many-headed serpent who had taken up residence in the Jamuna because he was scared of um, Garuda because Garuda is Krishna's eagle carrier but he is because he's an eagle he's a bird of prey then he eats snakes that's what he eats for food uh, but Garuda had been cursed uh, previously that he couldn't enter the Yamuna been priest but cursed by um, Sobari Muni Anyways, that's a long story. We might be able to get to that later or maybe tomorrow if you all are interested. But um, for now, Krishna has to contend with Kaliya. So Kaliya is there and Krishna immediately thought, we're going to take care of this snake quick. So uh, there's a Kadamba tree there. And that uh, Kaliya had poisoned the Yamuna so badly that all the um, plants and uh, just in the vicinity of that area it wasn't the whole Yamuna, but it was just an area where the Yamuna kind of like, you know how rivers sometimes uh, they're flowing across the flat place and they'll like spread out and make kind of like a lake. So that's what it was. It was a lake within the river. It was where the river had kind of like spread out over the flat plains. And, uh, but it was actually very deep at that place. It's described that the, the lake was eight miles wide. It was huge. And it was almost as deep as, it was deep as the ocean. It was really big. And Kaliya was this huge serpent. And he lived there with all of his wives and family and extended family and friends. They had a whole city of snakes there. And they were all poisonous. So it wasn't just Kaliya, but Kaliya was the, the chief of all of them. And he was the most poisonous and the most uh, envious. So, um, yeah, so... The all and even if a bird, it was the fumes that were rising from that river were so uh, toxic that even if a bird or insect flew over the that lake, it would just drop dead and fall into the water and get eaten up by Kaliya and his friends. That's how bad it was. But the only reason, the only tree that was anywhere for miles, the only uh, piece of vegetation that was growing anywhere near Kaliya's lake was this Kadamba tree because previously the um, 
when Garuda was flying over after getting the nectar from the churning of the milk ocean, the nectar of immortality that the demigods drank, he had that nectar and a drop of it fell on the, that Kadamba tree. So the Kadamba tree was, uh, um, you know, immortal, basically. And that Kadamba tree is still there in Vrindavan. You can see that tree. It's an amazing old tree. And it's been there, I mean, since uh, before 5,000 years ago. <laughs> it's still there. Uh, so yeah, that, so Krishna got up on that tree and he tightened up his belt and he, he slapped his arms like he would do whenever he was going to do some, you know, chivalrous feat or some, you know, tough guy kind of uh, activity. And then he jumped into the Yamuna. So, of course, when uh, everybody saw that Krishna jumped into the Yamuna, they they basically thought that's it. Now he's going to be dead because, you know, like I was saying, any animal like a deer or tiger or any animal that got anywhere near the Yamuna, without even the boys, without even drinking it, they just just touching it with their fingertips, they they fainted. So Krishna was still small, you know, he was just a child and uh, very delicate with his little lotus feet, and you know, he was so sweet and soft and tender and delicate. So. It was just, they're thinking it's just impossible that Krishna is going to um, survive that being, you know, totally submerged in the Yamuna. So when Krishna, he jumped in and then he started splashing, making a lot of noise. But even, even when he jumped in, he jumped from a high branch and he kind of cannonballed in. He made a big splash, a big noise. And uh, the water, um, he made himself really heavy, you know, like he did with Trinavarta. He made himself so heavy that the waves overflowed the banks and it was a big thing. He was trying to get the attention of Kaliya because he was angry at how Kaliya had polluted the Yamuna. This may be the first example uh, of environmental pollution, <laughs> the pollution of the Yamuna by Kaliya. So, um, so when he jumped in, Kaliya got really angry and so did all the snake friends. And they all started like, uh, they all um, came up and started breathing, like huffing and puffing, like, <sighs> and then all this poison and poisonous gases were coming out of their mouth and making everything even more toxic. So, yeah. Then uh, Krishna went, as soon as he saw Kaliya, then Krishna started just swimming around Kaliya, kind of like teasing uh, Kaliya. And Kali had all these heads. It was, wasn't just a snake with like a one body, a head and tail. It was Kali had many heads and they were going around like this. And Krishna would, just kept dodging them. The heads were like snapping, snap at Krishna. And Krishna would just dodge. So Krishna was like having a fun time getting chased around. And um, he was just smiling and he was fearless. And he was just playing. With, but the more he played with Krishna, with Kali, the more angry Kali was getting. And then uh, finally, and Kali also appreciated that Krishna was very beautiful. It says here in um, chapter 16, text 9, Kali saw that Sri Krishna, who wore yellow silken garments, was very delicate, his attractive body shining like a glowing white cloud, his chest bearing the mark of Sri Vatsa, his face smiling beautifully, and his feet resembling the whirl of a lotus flower. The Lord was playing fearlessly in the water. Despite his wonderful appearance, uh, the envious Kaliya furiously bit him on the chest and then completely enwrapped him in his coils. Let's see if someone put a question here. Parthasarthi says, you mentioned that the demons Krishna killed were attacking like the coward boys, but it seems like Krishna is the aggressor here is their significance. Well, the thing is that uh, because Kaliya had harmed his devotees, so that's like something that Krishna doesn't tolerate even worse than the demon attacking Krishna personally is Krishna harming the devotees. So, you know, Krishna had, Kaliya had caused all of his devotees to fall unconscious and, you know, killed so many of the animals of the Raj forest and polluted the Yamuna. The Yamuna Devi is also a devotee. So Krishna just can't tolerate that kind of thing. He had to do something to protect the devotees. That's Krishna's nature that he acts very quickly and um, fearlessly to protect his devotees. 
But here Krishna was, now he's enwrapped in the coils. And uh, so by this time, um, some of the boys had run home to their parents and they told them, oh, the Yamuna is poisoned and Krishna jumped in. And so Madhya Yashoda, Nandamraj, practically everybody in Vrindavan, all the Rajavasis went running there. So there's this huge crowd, the whole village had gathered on the bank of the Yamuna. And when they saw Krishna, because um, he went under, and then when he came up, he was wrapped up in Kaliya serpents with his head sticking out, you know, and they were just like, so grief stricken. They were like stunned with grief. And, uh, you know, because they lived for Krishna, Krishna was their life and soul. They just given up everything for Krishna. And, uh, and so when they saw him like that, most of them just fainted. The cowherd boys, they all just fell to the ground like trees that had been, you know, chainsawed. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and, uh, and even the cows and the calves, they were mooing uh, pitifully. Uh, they were just staring at Krishna. All everybody, anybody could do is just stare at Krishna. And uh, it says that the cows were so shocked that they couldn't even cry. Like they, they were too shocked to shed tears. That's what it says. And so that time also in Vrindavan, uh, there are all these bad omens. Like we were hearing in the class this morning about how when Krishna left the planet, there were many old, bad omens. So the same thing happened here when Krishna was in the, the, the grips of Kaliya. There were earthquakes in the sky. There were meteors falling. Um, People's bodies were quivering. The left side of the body was quivering of the men. The right side of the women were quivering. And everybody was feeling that there was some danger. And so the Brajabasis, even before getting there, they had seen these omens and they were thinking, oh no, something is wrong. Something's wrong with Krishna. He's in trouble. Maybe he's dead. So they were like really terrified at the possibilities. And you imagine, you know, like uh, you're just fearing the worst. You know, if you hear like, some bad news happened to a beloved child or family member. It's like, you're just, if you don't know the details. You're just, your mind starts going crazy. Like just thinking the worst case scenario. So that's what they were doing. They were running towards the, they were following his footsteps. They weren't, they didn't even know exactly where he was, but Krishna has these distinctive marks on his feet. So they're like tracking him with his foot. And then they come uh, there. So uh, they all get there and uh, everybody is, you know, like in a state of uh, panic and terror and just so many mixed emotions going on, uh, except for Balaram. Balaram's just smiling <laughs> because Balaram knows that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and everything is going to be okay. He understands Krishna's extraordinary power. And he's also thinking, this is what Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur says, it says, Lord Balaram was laughing because he thought, Krishna never cares to play with me in my form of Ananta Shesh, but now he's playing with this ordinary mundane snake named Kaliya. It's like, what is this? So he was like, this Krishna is too much. <laughs> and so some of the cowherd men are wanting to run into the Yamuna to dive in to save Krishna. And then Balaram is having to restrain them. He's physically holding them. He's telling them to stop. And, uh, and he's, or he's just smiling at them to try to comfort them and reassure him that, every, reassure them that everything is okay. And uh, the women are fainting. Madhya Shoda is going, <laughs> Madhya Shoda is like hallucinating. She's going to run off to the distance in the forest mm -hmm. to some trees, thinking that the trees are like snake charmers. And she's saying, snake charmer, come, we need somebody to go and, you know, play your music and charm this snake. He has my son in his grips and I'm counting on you to save him. And uh, like that, when they showed this, just in a state of uh, delirium. And then the other gopis, although they're feeling as much distress as you showed it, they're trying to console her. They're trying to and hold her back because she's you know running to the tree she's running back there she's rushing towards the water the edge of the water and they're just uh, holding on to her and uh, trying to you know 
like calm themselves down so that they can take care of Mother Yashoda, basically. They're holding on to her and, and they're telling pastimes of Krishna. <laughs> oh, Krishna, this, and they try to just like distract her because the only thing that's going to distract Mother Yashoda's mind from Krishna is Krishna. <laughs> so they're telling some uh, nice pastimes of Krishna to try to just get her to um, be more peaceful. Then, uh, yeah, so then um, Balaram says to Krishna, he says, Krishna, just see, you know, your, res the, your beloved residents of Vrindavan, your mother, your father, your friends, your, everybody, they're all suffering so much seeing you like this. They're all practically dying with grief, uh, seeing you like that in the coil of the serpent because of their intense love for you. And you're the only you're the purpose of their life. They, you, you're the reason, you're the person that they live for, the reason that they live, their only goal, their only shelter, all that. He said, you can't leave them in that situation. So then Krishna, when he saw the state of the Rajavasis, then he slipped out of Kaliya's uh, coils. And uh, it's described how like Kaliya, um, Oh, what Krishna did was actually what it's described here in text 24 is that Krishna expanded his body. So Kaliya had a grip on him and then Krishna just, he expanded his body so that Kaliya felt like his own body was getting like torn apart because it was like wrapped around and it was growing and it was just like pushing pressure, pressure. And he felt like his body was getting uh, ripped apart. So then he was forced to let go. So then Krishna could you know, Kaliya used his grip and Krishna was able to slip out. But then Kaliya was very angry. And it says that his nostrils looked like vessels for cooking poison. <laughs> and they were steaming with so much uh, vapors, poisonous vapors. And Kaliya's eyes were like fire browns. They were like red and looked like they were shooting fire. So with those eyes, Kaliya looked at Krishna and he licked his lips with his bifurcated tongues, so his split tongues, the way snakes do, like that. And, uh, and he just stared at Krishna with a glance full of terrible poisonous fire. But then Krishna was, again, playing, just circling him, just playing with him the way that Garuda would play with a snake or the way a cat would play uh, with a mouse. And Kali was moving about trying to find a way to bite him, but he couldn't do it. Then Krishna just grabbed hold of one of Kaliya's hoods and pulled it down and he stepped onto it. And then he started doing his uh, dance. It says Krishna, the original master of all fine arts. So if anybody appreciates any kind of art, Krishna is the master of all fine arts, painting and drawing and dancing and drama. And so now Krishna is doing his dance. And um, it's funny. I have... Uh, Buri John Prabhu, when he was describing these pastimes, let's see if I find it here, what he says. Oh, it's here. He says, This is the original Bollywood movie. I don't know if you've seen Bollywood movies, but in these Indian movies, they're very funny. They'll be like, you know, like drama, like an ordinary movie. And then right in the middle of uh, some scene, it'll just break into this big uh, dance scene where there's like hundreds of people and they're doing all these dance moves and there's song, there's singing. And yeah, so uh, like this Krishna's pastime, it comes to this state of, you know, suspense and dramatic, dramatic tension when everybody's just about to like die out of anxiety and worry for Krishna. And then it just breaks into this crazy dance scene where Krishna is doing, you know, the Bharatnatyam. And uh, not only that, but the demigods are, um, I mean, he's, do he's doing all these like steps, fancy steps, and he's got his ankle bells on. It's like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. and he's doing the mudras with the hands and the eye movements, you know, how they do the head and the eyes. And so he's doing all that, like the whole thing. Uh, and then the demigods are in the sky and they're looking on, and when they see Krishna dancing, then they're like, oh yeah. So they start playing uh, the, their musical instruments and they're singing and showering flowers. And uh, just to increase, this increases the, the, you know, the artistic effect of, of Krishna's uh, performance. So yeah, the, the demigods, I mean, their nature is to always assist the Lord. 
and offer their services according to whatever their capacities. So the different demigods are different, uh, they specialize in different things. The Gandharvas are very famous for singing. And then the Apsaras are famous for dancing. So according to, and then there's the sages, they're always reciting prayers. So then whatever they're expert at, they were as, uh, supporting Krishna's pastime by employing their, their talents. So, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so just like dancers, if you see these Bharat Natyam dancers, sometimes they'll like kick the ground very hard. It'll make like a slapping noise with their feet. And so Krishna started doing that on Kaliya's heads. He was making this pounding and slapping sounds to the, to the beat, to the music. And as soon as one head of Kaliya would come up, then Krishna would jump on that and stomp it down. Then another head would come and he would stomp that one down. So he was jumping from head to head and doing ting, 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 crashing it, squashing it down and then ting, ting, squashing the other one down. And when he would stomp on the, make that slapping noise with his foot on the head, then the, that head would start vomiting blood and all the, it would vomit out blood and also all the poison was coming out too. So in this way, Krishna was um, purifying Kaliya of his anartas, <laughs> a little purification going on there that uh, step and then vomit out the poison. Yeah. So this is kind of a, you know, figuratively, you could look at this figuratively that this is how Krishna consciousness works that by the mercy of Krishna's lotus feet, <laughs> that uh, he removes our anartas, he removes our, our pride. And every time our, our, pride or our false ego, all those things we were mentioning yesterday, rise up, then Krishna will uh, force it down. Or he may do it directly, or he may engage one of his agents to do so. Yeah, as long as we keep raising up our hoods, then Krishna keeps having to push them back down. But then you could ask that, um, because here Kali is being just smashed, smashed, smashed. And we see that in the material world, like basically everybody's getting smashed, but not everybody is getting purified or becoming a devotee through that, by that, you know, material miseries. So yeah, it's a fact that just by being smashed by the material energy, uh, people don't become devotees. That something else is required to um, give meaning to all the pain. Otherwise, it's just kind of people can't understand why am I suffering? What is going on? They, they, it doesn't, you know, they don't put two and two together and understand that, oh, I'm suffering because of my sinful reactions, because of my own activities. I need to take responsibility and be a good religious person. They don't think like that. They just try to solve. They try to escape the suffering or, you know, fix the problem or something like that. So what enables us to make sense, what enables the suffering of the material world to um, benefit us is the association of devotees. So Kaliya was lucky, and that's why Krishna didn't kill Kaliya, is because his wives were actually devotees. And many times they had tried to advise Kaliya to surrender to Krishna, but he had never listened to them. <laughs> so then uh, out of compassion on Kaliya's wives, were devotees then krishna arranged this whole pastime because you know they're married they're devotees but they're married to this husband who's a demon who's very envious of krishna and wants to you know harm krishna and harm krishna's devotees so that's a very painful situation for them and so krishna wants to help them relieve the wives the devotee wives from their distress by basically making their husband a devotee <laughs> And the way he does it is through this stomping on his head. And so because uh, now he, Krishna brings him to a totally hopeless, helpless condition where he has to surrender to Krishna. He has no choice where he has to accept Krishna's superior strength, uh, that Krishna must be the Supreme Personality of Godhead, just as his wife has been telling him all this time and uh, to take shelter of Krishna. So like this, uh, Kaliya surrendered. But it, it's also described, uh, this is not in the Bhagavatam, but it's described by um, Sanatana Goswami, I think. 
Let's see if I find it here just to make sure I give you the right reference. Oh. Yeah, it's Sanatana Goswami. So Sanatana Goswami in the Brihat Bhagavatam Rita, he says that um, when Krishna was in the coils or when, when Krishna was with Kali, then the gopis, they were there and they were uh, running towards the water and because, you know, they also, Krishna is their life and soul. What are they going to do without Krishna? So they're thinking, let's try to help him. So they're rushing towards the water. And at that point, Krishna made that Kali uh, bowed down all of his hoods so that each gopi was standing on a different hood. And then, uh, and Kaliya's hoods had these jewels on them, these like shining red jewels. So it was just like a dance floor, like a jewel studded dance floor. And so each gopi was on, one gopi was on each hood. And then Krishna expanded himself to be on every hood and was dancing with the, each gopi on each hood. And this way they're having a big rasa dance right there in the, <laughs> there in the middle of the Yamuna on Kaliya. So, you know, Krishna was enjoying this um, transcendental pastime. But all this was going on in a way that nobody else could understand that it was happening. Nobody, uh, apart from Krishna and the gopis, nobody knew that this uh, Rasa Lila was taking place. Yeah. Everyone was just remained there on the, sh everyone else remained there on the shore, just kind of like grief stricken and fainting and Balaram trying to take care of them, pacify them, console them. So, um, all right, so now Kalia is totally, um, uh, after that rasa dance on his head, Kalia is just totally, his body is physically shattered, uh, but he is spiritually um, coming to his spiritual senses, because after all, he's gotten the dust of Krishna's lotus feet. And even Kalia's wives, they're saying to Krishna, they're like asking again and again, how is it that our husband has received such great mercy? You know, yogis and uh, jnanis, they're, um, they're uh, always striving for the tips of the toes of the Lord, but they can't even, you know, approach him. And somehow our husband, who's just a demon, he hasn't done a single good thing in his lifetime, has gotten the, the mercy of the dust of the Lord's lotus feet. So there. Uh, yeah, so they're wondering, what, what did he do? And of course, they're devotees, so they're very humble. So they're not thinking, oh, it's due to our association that Krishna is being kind to him. <laughs> they're not thinking like that. They're just thinking that, um, uh, that they're just thinking, what austerities did he perform? Did he do some religious thing that we didn't know about? So, yeah. I'm just looking at my notes here. So yeah, then what happens is that the, 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 um, the wives of Kalia, they get their children, the little baby snakes, <laughs> and they put them in the front and then they pay full dandavats to Krishna, who's yeah. there on Kalia, and they pray to Krishna to save their husband. <laughs> High school musical. <laughs> Wait, somebody else a question here? Oh no, that was the previous one. Yeah, so they're praying to Krishna, please uh, save our husband. Please don't kill him because if you kill him, then uh, what are we going to do? We have our small children and we are women. We need to be under the protection of our husband. And if he's dead, we'll have to, you know, we'll end up, you know, being exploited by uh, some other snake. So it's better if you just um, keep him. And uh, now, anyways, now that they saw that he had a change of heart, they saw that Kali's heart, his attitude towards Krishna had changed. So they're thinking, we just keep him alive. He's going to be good now. It's going to be nice now. So then Krishna, he honored their request. Pardon, you have your hand up there. Yeah, I was, I was wondering how these wonderful devotees could end up in a relationship like this. It yeah. almost seems not right. Uh huh. It's not explained. It's I didn't see the explanation for that anywhere. Like how, you know, these devoted snake women. <laughs> and, the, and the biggest the, demon. It's like, what's that? They ended up with the biggest demon. Like, 
Yeah. What? Like why? How? You know? How would that? Why would you do that? Why, how would that happen? Yeah, there must be. I mean, there is a backstory in relation to Kalia. That Kalia, he comes from actually. Um, probably we'll get to this. Let me see. Since you raised the question, I, I do have some notes on this. Uh, Yeah. I'll probably have to get back to you about this tomorrow because it's going to take too long for me to look it up. But I do have notes on this. It's not, it doesn't talk about the wives, but it talks about how, um, because see, Garuda, actually Garuda, Kalia and Garuda are brothers. And mm. Garuda is a devotee. He's, um, you know, he, uh, he's Krishna's carrier. So, Yeah. It seems that there was a time when Kalia was also not so bad, but just the circumstances of his life led him to become inimical to Krishna. Because, because the thing is, like, Kalia and Garuda had a very bad relationship, the two brothers. There was just very intense sibling, sibling rivalry between the two of them. So I think that because Garuda ended up being closely aligned with Krishna, then Kalia, because he hated Garuda, then he just hated Krishna too. And there were other things too, but you got to talk about that more tomorrow. I think tomorrow we have a little bit of time. Now it's like I need to wrap up this pastime <laughs> because Taco Tuesday is going to start. But um, yeah, so uh, the wives of Kalia offer these really nice uh, prayers. And they also offer lots of gifts because Kalia had, you know, all these sunken treasures. He had he and his snakes had collected all these jewels and things. And even when Krishna was dancing on Kalia, he uh, arranged that his kastuba jewel would fall off and that the wives would catch it. And so they actually offered him back his kastuba jewel. And they took great joy in being able to offer that, you know, the Lord's own personal, like, signature ornament. And Krishna was very happy with them. And... Yeah, they're offering obeisances, obeisances again and again in the later text of this chapter. And then, okay, so then they say, I'm reading now from text 51, at least once a master should tolerate an offense committed by his child or subject. O supreme peaceful soul, you should therefore forgive our foolish husband who did not understand who you are. Because they had just glorified Krishna as being the, the creator of the universe and um, you know, the source of everything. So he's saying you're also the source of Kalia. So Kalia is also your, an expansion of your own energy, and therefore he's like your son. So when a, a child, a son, or a subject commits some offense, then the master should forgive because the master is like, you know, more magnanimous personality, generous, gracious, and the servant is just, the child is just foolish, just out of ignorance. Uh, he acted the way he did. But, you know, you're not an ignorant person. You're a very gracious and uh, knowledgeable, forgiving person. So please excuse him. Please be merciful. And then they ask, they say also, it is proper for the, the saintly to feel compassion for women like us. This serpent is about to give up his life. Please give us back our husband, who is our life and soul. So saying, please, uh, you know, we also... Um, be merciful to him and be merciful to us. And tell us what we should do. Uh, certainly anyone who faithfully executes your orders automatically freed from all fear. So they said, we, we're willing to, they said, we're willing to do anything you want. Just tell us what to do, but save him. And so then Krishna released Kaliya, uh, who by the, this time, as soon as Krishna let go of him, he just flopped. He just fell down unconscious because his heads were so uh, smashed in. Uh, and so after these prayers, when the, his wives appealed to him, then Kaliya regained his consciousness. And then he spoke to Krishna. And he said the same thing. He said that, you know, I was born as a snake and by, the, by nature, the nature of snakes is to be envious and ignorant and angry. So, you know, this is just my conditioning. This is my nature. What can I do? Uh, 
And then he says, uh, how can I give up my own nature? Yeah, he says, oh Lord, since you are the omniscient Lord of the universe, you are the actual cause of freedom from illusion. Please arrange for us whatever you consider proper, whether it be mercy or punishment. So here he basically, he admits his ignorance. He says, this is my condition. He, tried to, he tries to invoke Krishna's sympathy. And then uh, says, again, like the wise, whatever you want, we'll do. Just tell us what is proper. What, what should we do now? Where should we go from here? If you want to punish me further, you can do it. If you want to be merciful, you can do it. I, I'm a soul surrendered to you now. So then Krishna, he said, he uh, had a little bit of sympathy for Kaliya. And he said, uh, all right, um, I'm not going to do anything more to you, but you can't stay in the Yamuna. You need to go back to the ocean and take your wives and your children and all of your friends and your whole snake community um, with you because we need the Yamuna to, to be clean for the cows and the humans who live in Vrindavan. And uh, he said, you don't need to worry about Garuda because um, now you've got the imprints of my lotus feet on your head and Garuda will see that and he'll respect that and uh, he'll consider you to be an object of my mercy and he won't bother you. So that way uh, it ends. Kali and his wives all go. But before going, Kali uh, worships the Lord yeah, it says, Kaliya worshiped the Lord of the universe by offering him fine garments along with necklaces, jewels, and other valuable ornaments, wonderful scents and ointments, and a large garland of lotus flowers. Having thus pleased the Lord, whose flag is marked with the emblem of Garuda, Kaliya felt satisfied. Receiving the Lord's permission to leave, Kaliya circumambulated him and offered him obeisances. Then taking his wives, friends, and children, he went to his island in the sea. The very moment that Kaliya left, the Yamuna was immediately restored to her orig original condition, free from poison and full of nectarian water. This happened by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is man manifesting a human-like form to enjoy his pastimes. So that's the end of the Kaliya, Krishna's chastising Kaliya. There's a lot of, um, there's so many things that we could say about this, but not much time. Anybody have any questions? What does oh what does Kalia represent? Yeah. So Kalia represents a few things because he's a snake, so envy and also cruelty, brutality, and violence, which I guess are kind of the same. So yeah, cruelty, brutality, and envy. So it's envy with a real desire to like violently hurt someone. And we see how he tried to like, he snapped at Krishna and just poisoning uh, everyone, everything. So yeah, so we conditioned souls have these things in our hearts, you know, we, we all have a little bit of envy and sometimes even devotees, we can exhibit a little bit of a mean streak, you know, we can sometimes uh, do think, do mean things to people or to each other also. But we just have to ask Krishna to dance on our heads and push this uh, poison out to enact a change in our hearts. And uh, said that when we chant, uh, Rupa Goswami has that very beautiful verse that he says that when the holy name, when we chant the holy name, the holy name enters the ears and goes to the courtyard of the heart and dances there in our hearts. So we can have like a visual image that our hearts are full of uh, anartas that are like Kaliya. <laughs> and uh, the holy name goes there and dances all over the heads, stomping on the heads of our anartas and crushing them and smashing them and obliterating them and uh, causing a change of heart, just like Kaliya had a change of heart. Yeah. All right. I guess we'll stop here then so that everybody can go to Taco Tuesday.
Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Krishna chastising Kaliya Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gaur Premanandi, Hari Bo.